Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. I think it's kind of hard to explain exactly what I do for a living in one concise and understandable sentence, but I'll try anyway. My name is Jamie, and I kill various monsters, beasts, and various other paranormal beings on the request of my boss, who runs an interdimensional city under the all-binding fist of autocracy. If that sentence sounds like a confusing handful, it's because it is. Hell, I hardly even understand what I'm doing, and I've been at this job for months now. I'm not sure if I should be more floored by the fact that being a paranormal hitman is my first and only job I've ever had, or the fact that my boss first hired me during a class of summer school gone horribly awry. I was 16 at the time of my initial employment, so I was a naive and foolhardy kid who didn't really understand the gravity of what I was getting myself into so I took the job without a second thought. So if you notice any bad decisions or poor planning on my part, blame my naivete. Before anyone objects and says how inhumane and cruel it is to hire a child as a hitman, let me assure you that my boss takes utmost caution and care one can have while commissioning a hitman. I can personally attest that my boss is always looking out for me one way or another. It's hard to explain, but I really trust the guy. He gets me, if you know what I mean. We have a personal connection, him and I. The boss initially hired me because I happen to perfectly fit the mold of characteristics and qualities he looks for in the various clients he has around the country. He described me as brave and chivalrous when he scouted me, two descriptions that don't really seem like qualities that a hitman would have, but you really have to look at the bigger picture to understand my boss's mindset. I'm being tasked with protecting the sum of the human population, essentially. The existence of the paranormal is largely unknown to the human race, save for a few shadowy government branches and my fellow clients tasked with dealing with them. I hunt monsters for a reason, after all, and to better aid me with this job I was given some nifty items and a particularly special ability to boot. As soon as I agreed to become one of his clients, he gifted me with the ability to cause matter to decay at the cellular level with just a touch, a superpower my younger self would have gone nuts over. I'm expecting some questions about that statement, and all I'll say for now is that I had to find this power on my own. Boss doesn't like me asking questions about it, says that I need to find out for myself or some nonsense like that. I don't really get his train of thought, but I trust him to know what he's talking about. I discovered this power during my first encounter with the paranormal. I was being chased by the zombified corpse of a school faculty member. Long story. In desperation, I grabbed his neck to try and get him off my tail, but I found that when I touched his neck, my hands began to smoke, and I felt his neck slowly turn into ash between my palms. I prefer calling it a technique, but you can feel free to call it a superpower. I haven't exactly found a precise way to control it, it more so just activates whenever I want it to when I'm touching something with my hands. As you would imagine, this has come in super handy while on the job. My preferred method of utilization is to wait for my target to either be asleep or distracted, then I disintegrate their throat via strangulation. If they can't call for help, then it makes my job so much easier, and I can eliminate them without the threat of being seen. Next, I aim for the eyes by poking them with my fingers. If the Odyssey taught me anything, it's always easier to deal with a blind monster than one that can see. I'm not implying that all of my targets even have eyes or throats to attack. I'm just laying out my preferred strategy for dealing with my targets. The ones that don't have either are far more challenging, but I've managed to deal with the few that come up. For the items I was given, I got a whole goodie bag full of them. Night vision goggles, a med kit, high-powered flashlight, and various other tools crammed inside of a backpack. Funnily enough, I've used these tools for less than I probably should on contracts. I'd say the flashlight comes in most handy, and maybe the goggles come in a close second. Normally I would have kept my mouth shut, would a beaky board shut, and not let any of these details fly, but my boss said it was fine to write about, stating something along the lines of, who would believe you anyway? I can't really argue with that, so here I am now, typing down my experiences and stories I've had in my line of work over the past couple of months for your entertainment. If I manage to survive my upcoming contracts, then I might be able to keep updating here with new and exciting encounters with the ugly bastards I kill for a living. 
For today I'd like to ease you guys and gals in with my very first assignment I was tasked with, the Dogman of Macon County. If the name didn't suggest it, this was one mean-looking son of a bitch. Imagine a seven-foot-tall, burly man with the outstretched nose and snout of a canine, and who glued the hair of someone's sheepdog to his skin with gorilla glue. Allow me to detail how I go about finding my targets. Firstly, I receive a letter in my mailbox at a random date with pictures, location, and a brief outline of whatever target I'm assigned to. I'm given a date I need to eliminate the target by, and as long as I do so by that date, I get a sizable payment in the form of a wad of cash in the mail. It's strange to think that someone as influential and otherworldly as my boss would use the postal service to communicate with me, but I've learned that he has a certain fondness for this system, so I'm fine with him using it. These paychecks aren't cheap either. Despite being an otherworldly being with alien currency, my boss has a seemingly infinite amount of money to give to me per paycheck, ranging from the thousands up to $100,000. Initially, I received my paychecks through direct deposits, but I didn't want to make my parents suspect me of doing any illegal activity when I get wired a couple grand seemingly out of nowhere. The picture I got of the dogman was taken somewhere in the middle of the woods behind a tree, looking like one of those shoddy Bigfoot photos. Despite the poor quality of the photo, I could still make enough details on the dogman to make me shudder. I had until Friday of next week to take this thing out, but I didn't want to let procrastination get the better of me, so I headed out the day after I got the letter, bringing with me the med kit and the goggles I got from the backpack. I told my parents a lie about having a sleepover at a friend's house, and they took the bait and wished me a good time. As I said, I was naive and didn't realize what I was getting myself into, so I never once thought that I could easily get slaughtered and die in the middle of the forest, leaving my parents with another dead child. The coordinates on the letter led me to Macon County, a small hole-in-the-wall community that looked like they skipped out on the technological zeitgeist of the 2000s. The entire community was a forested rural area full of farmlands that stretched as far as the eye can see, full of browning magenta radishes, monstrously sized potatoes, and more livestock than one could ever need. Flocks of fluffy, plump sheep and herds of fat Holstein cows ate the bountiful grass and frolicked in the plentiful farmlands. Each house and barn in the county was made of dirty wood and crumbling brick and looked a sneeze away from collapsing altogether. The most modern building they had that wasn't a drinking hole was an old McDonald's located near a farmer's market, so I paid for a large fry and parked my car in their parking lot. Once I got there, I resigned myself to playing the waiting game. It's not a fun game, but it's a game you gotta learn to play if you're trying to kill someone discreetly. Thankfully, I got to McDonald's at around 6.30 p.m., so it would only take a little over an hour for the sun to set and the moon to come up, so I sat snug in my car and munched on my oversalted fries. Once the sun finally set, I hopped out of my car and grabbed the night vision goggles and held them up to my eyes to navigate the forest where the dogman roamed. Sadly, these goggles proved to be less effective than they were made out to be. I should have been suspicious that they looked like a bulky pair of binoculars rather than the typical military headset optometrist machine cross that real night vision goggles look like, but I was hopeful. Looking through the goggles was like looking through an old video camera from the 90s. Choppiness, grainy textures, and motion blur all over. I could see my surroundings well enough, but it wasn't up to snuff. The temperature had dropped by 10 during my hour-long waiting game, but I thought ahead enough to bring a coat. What I didn't think ahead to bring was any sort of weapons that would give me an edge if I had to fight this thing. I ended up picking up a big stone near a tree in case I had to put down the dogman and bludgeon him to death. Let me tell you, that fucker can hide like you wouldn't believe. The only reason I even found the guy was a narrow, flattened makeshift path made from the scattered fallen leaves. I followed that trail and it led me to a small, cozy-looking cabin right in the middle of the woods. The county was fairly remote to begin with, but this was a step above that. Who builds a cabin in the middle of absolutely nowhere in a forest? Was living in this remote town just not isolating enough? I saw the scratched-up wooden door in the cabin rattle from side to side, so I hightailed it back and hid near some leaves to avoid being seen. Out of the door came a sight I will never forget. It was a bulky man who looked nearly seven feet tall and covered in dark hair so coarse and thick it looked like fur walking out of the cabin, tilting his head left and right as if he were looking for someone. 
I was confused at first, but the gears were turning in my head. This was the dog man. He shared the thick hair and the ridiculous height, but he lacked the canine face that the beast in the photographs had, and I knew why. This a dogman was a werewolf, and right now he was in his regular human body. I'm not implying being seven feet tall is normal, but it's sure a hell lot closer to being normal than having a dog snout and stealing farm animals for food. The dogman went back inside his house and rattled the door again, locking it shut. My monstrous as my target looked when he was transformed into a furry, he was still a human underneath it all. There wasn't a full moon out, so I guess it made sense that he hadn't transformed. My knowledge of werewolves is basically non-existent, but I think I understood the logic behind their furry transformation. I got up from my hiding place and walked towards his house, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I took a second to rationalize what I was doing. Was I really going to kill this guy? No, I had to take this guy out, monster or not. Monsters like him aren't supposed to be here. They're products of being exposed to the monsters roaming the city my boss rules over. Long story. How one becomes a monster is through the various beasts and energies that leak out from my boss's city, Pandemonium. It acts as something of a port city between dimensions, so all forms of beasts roam the streets at night. The guards he hires to protect the city are kind of shitty at their jobs, so he gets people like me to mop up everything that escapes from the city to Earth. However, not all monsters are made like this. It's common for those escapee monsters to attack and spread to the regular human population, increasing their numbers. I don't know if the dogman was an escapee or a victim of an attack, but it didn't really matter. He needed to die so I can keep the world safe and not let them find out the existence of the paranormal. The forest felt a lot lonelier and foreboding when I went over the facts, so I decided to check on the dogman through a window in his cabin. He was fast asleep, thankfully. Taking deep breaths, I crept up to his door and placed my palm flat against the door, slowly disintegrating the spot by rotting the wood. Once my hand passed through the other side, I reached my arm around the doorknob and twisted it unlocked, and I let myself in. The dogman was in a deep sleep, grumbling a booming snore that sounded like he had an unhealthy amount of phlegm stuck in his throat, and it was trying to escape. I walked gently towards the bed he slept in, feeling the warmth of the crackling fireplace envelop my body from the chilly air. The cloak of darkness largely hid the house in shadow, but the fireplace put a spotlight on the cozy living room, decorated with an antique oak couch with a bearskin rug underneath. Considering who I was dealing with, I was sure he made that rug himself. The wall closest to his bed was filled with taxidermy heads of various animals. Deers, bears, even a caribou all mounted proudly on wooden plaques. I stopped focusing on the details of the cabin and quietly marched towards the snoring monster, my rock at the ready. I stood over him and raised the rock high above my head, prepared to slam it down directly into his head. I won't lie, my arms were shaking something fierce and my breath caught in my throat. I was hesitating and unsure if I was really capable of bludgeoning this guy in his sleep. I tried to reassure myself that because he was asleep, he would be killed painlessly if I was able to crush his skull quickly enough. I'm not sure if I was breathing too hard or this was fate getting back at me, but he woke up and groggily looked at me with tired eyes. After a second he jumped out of bed with phenomenal speed and lunged at me, slamming me into the ground and making me drop my rock. I came face to face with him, and he was already starting to change into his werewolf form. In hindsight, I still don't know how he was able to change into his werewolf form so quickly, but that's neither here or there. His face began to stretch and contort grotesquely. His nose began to morph into his face, which expanded like a fleshy Pinocchio snout. His pupils dilated and his teeth and gums shifted into the sharp, fang-like teeth of a Rottweiler. Without wasting a moment, I jammed my hand into his face and tried to claw the spaces where his fur didn't grow in yet. The few fleshy spots began to melt like peeling paint, and he recoiled, jumping off of me and clutching his face with his claws, whimpering like a puppy. I rolled and got back up on my feet and scanned the ground to find my rock. Instead, I saw a rusty black fireplace poker leaning against the fireplace, so I grabbed the poker and dipped the top into the fire, letting the metal heat up. I spun around and charged at the werewolf who had stopped clutching his face and snarled at me, a look of utmost primal rage in his eyes, his human eyes. 
I lunged and swiped the poker across his face with as much fury as I could muster, slashing through his fur and flesh like a hot knife through butter. I popped his eye and singed the right side of his cheek, causing him to howl loudly. I recoiled and jammed the poker into his right foot, twisting the poker until I heard the cracking of bone. I wasted no time with lurching at him, grabbing his thick furry neck and doing my best to strangle him in time so his throat could crumble away to nothing. My violent and sudden attack caught him off guard, and soon his dog-like whimpers became more and more muffled as my hands took hold of his throat, rapidly getting slimmer between my fingers. I felt chunks of hair and dust pass through my fingers as his cries became muted and his pupils dilated with the cold glaze of death approaching him. I had held on to his neck for so long that his head was too big for his dwindling neck to support and would have snapped at the slightest touch. I let go and let his lifeless body slump against the floor, blood pooling around his lifeless body. I felt a rush of adrenaline disorient me, making me lose my balance and tumble to the floor. I killed him, he's dead at my hands, it, it felt so surreal. Never in a million years could I envision myself to be a killer, even if what I was killing was monsters. Everything felt so disingenuous, being a child hitman, killing people with superpowers and fire pokers. I would have laughed at the absurdity of it all if I was in a better mood. Something just didn't sit right with me. I came into this mission feeling righteous and cocky, but now reality crashed and I finally felt the weight's grasp on me. I could have died. It was blind luck and quick thinking that kept me alive, really. I came in with almost no plan, no weapon, and expected to come out victorious and unscathed. I mean, I did kill him, and came out virtually unscathed, but it all felt hollow. I was looking at this as if it's a game with clear-cut winners and losers, but I was deceiving myself from the truth. I'm a cold-blooded killer, and I just slaughtered a man. It was for a good cause, right? Who knows what kind of violent mayhem he could have gone on had I not done what I did. It's for the good of everybody, no matter how I feel. But I knew I had to become accustomed to this feeling. This was the life I agreed to. This is my career, my calling. I had no idea how boss would react if I quit on the spot, nor did I want to think about it. I got up from the floor and yanked the poker from the werewolf's foot and disintegrated it, letting the dust fall to the floor. I wasn't sure where to go from here. Would anyone come looking for this guy? I knew Boss would gather the corpse and scrub any evidence of my crime, but he would still be missing. I just prayed that he was living off the grid, isolated from the world. His house seemed to suggest that, so my hopes weren't unfounded. I left the cabin and made my way back to the McDonald's parking lot, using the night vision goggles to guide myself. I sat down in my car and let the events play in my mind, again and again, soaking up what just happened. I wasn't keeping track of time, so I had no idea how long I was sitting still. Only when a faint glimpse of the morning sun gleamed through the sky did I come to and snap out of my internal conflict. I turned on my phone, saw that my bank account just received a direct deposit. I opened my app and saw that $7,500 had just been transferred to my account by an unlisted source. I still don't know how banks never caught on to boss's direct deposits, but I'm sure he has his reasons. Once I saw the money, I knew what I needed to do. I can't be this naive and foolhardy. I have to be ready. I need to be prepared. Come in armed to the teeth with weaponry, knowledge, and an airtight plan and come out on top. The only bills I had to pay is car insurance, so I had thousands of dollars at my frivolous fingertips. I decided there and then that this paycheck would go to all the things I needed to get an edge and survive my new occupation. I need to learn how to fight. I need weights to train with and I need gear to cover my tracks. I felt a flicker of determination through my entire body and started my car. I didn't want to go home just yet, but I didn't feel safe being a sitting duck out here. This is my life now. I need to get used to this feeling. I promise myself that no matter how long I live, I will always remember this day and how it made me feel. And I've kept that promise to this day, and I'm in a more confident place because of it. And that's the tale of my first kill. If I manage to survive long enough, I'll add some more stories about my career, but I probably won't go in exact order. Variety is the spice of life, you know? For now, I'm signing off. Have a good night, everyone. I'll make sure to report back in with a tale I'm sure everyone will enjoy. Cheers, Jamie. It's been a while, hasn't it? I hope that this submission is enough proof that I didn't get murked on the job, but I feel kinda bad that I've left everyone in the dark for so long. So, 
as my condolences, I'm going to give everyone two stories. I know I spoil you guys and gals, but how could I not feel so generous when my first part got so much praise? I owe you all something big, and this is my way to thank you. Before I get into my stories, I feel that I need to address something important. I got a comment addressing the whereabouts of the government branch I offhandedly mentioned in my first post, asking me if I was a victim of mind-wiping and if I was okay. For those of you who don't know, the old high school I attended was a victim to an absolute paranormal shitshow that rocked my worldview and landed me this job in the first place. It started right in the morning during a class of summer school I was in with two other students. We received an emergency weather warning over the intercom during an intense thunderstorm, but the announcement gave us peculiar instructions like not contacting 911 instead of telling us to wait for emergency services to come find us. As I later learned, these emergency services were actually a squadron of highly secretive government agency tasked with eliminating the various monsters that began to roam free in the school. I've yet to ever get an official explanation as to how these monsters even got to our school in the first place, but I'm assuming that they got there like how nearly all monsters get to Earth, through pandemonium, the interdimensional city boss rules over. If you want a good reason as to why people have jobs like mine, this is it. I don't know how many lives were lost that day, nor do I really want to entrench myself in the details. People like me do our best to ensure that this doesn't happen, that regular people don't have to become aware of and die at the hands of things that shouldn't exist in the first place. To summarize the event, all of the survivors were escorted by that government branch and were treated with some type of mind drug or hypnosis. I wasn't there so I don't have a clue as to what they did. And they forgot the entire incident. The story they all told the media was that the extreme weather conditions caused the school to shut down and that various EMS people came in and rescued them. I never saw any firefighters or cops near the school, but it's possible they came later once I and a friend left the school. Nah. I don't know much about the government branch that managed to cover all this up. What I can say for sure is that this was definitely not their first paranormal encounter. The few agents I met seemed way too at ease and comfortable for this to be a new experience. I did, however, see a logo that they all seemed to carry around, a patch with three skulls holding a book, fist and a blank board diagram in their mouths respectively. For clarity, I'm going to be referring to this organization as the Skulls until I can find an official name for these jokers. I'm reluctant to search for them on the internet, but the little searching I did held absolutely no results for them. Not a Wikipedia page or even WikiLeaks page in sight. I really wouldn't recommend trying to find any details about them, because their reach and influence is pretty frightening and can land you in some hot water. I had an encounter with them some time ago that I discussed in the comments section, but I'll elaborate here. A couple of days after I escaped the school, my mother heard a knock on the door and found that two strange men, as she described them, were standing there, looking intimidating and professional. They were wearing matching black suits and sunglasses so she couldn't tell them apart. They asked her about the weather disaster at the school that occurred and wanted to know how I got home from the event. I lied to mom and said that I drove home as soon as the emergency broadcast played, so that's what she told them. According to her, both of them left in a hurry and drove off right after and haven't come back since. I don't know how this sounds to anyone reading this, but hearing this recounted by my mother was deeply concerning. They know where I live, and there's probably a good chance they know that I remember everything, making me a target to their insidious mind-wiping. Sadly, the claustrophobic feeling of being watched has stuck with me to this day, putting an enormous amount of pressure on me. For this reason, I always like to cover my tracks, both in the literal sense and the metaphorical sense. I only pay for things in cash, always use a VPN when I'm on the internet, and I try not to give away too many private details about my life, even when I'm typing here. I know I might come off as being paranoid, but I know that my efforts weren't in vain. If I'm not careful, I'll get caught and mind-wiped. I managed to escape with someone named Felipe, who at the time was my best friend. In a way, we were survival buddies. We managed to fend off the various monsters roaming in the school and escape the school with the skin off our backs and drove home. Felipe may have been my first and only friend, but he meant so much more to me than that. He was my better half, someone who understood me and accepted me for who I was. I cherished him with the understanding and thoughtfulness of a brother, and the skulls took him away from me. 
They found him and stole his memory without a second thought, feeding him a lie about a weather phenomenon in place of what really happened that day. When I called him, he didn't recognize me in the slightest, and now wants nothing to do with me. As much as it hurts to lose him, I really think it's for the better. This line of work is dangerous, so the fewer people I associate with, the chance of them being injured or killed is minimized. All around, it was a complete fucking disaster that I don't ever want to go through again. Sorry for going on such a tangent. I just felt like I needed to get some things off my chest. Now that that's over, let's get started with the two tales I have for tonight. Keep in mind that the numbers I list with these targets are in order based on how many I've taken out. Target hash 12, hybrid. By this point, it's been nearly two months since my first target, so I was considerably more prepared and confident with this contract. I started a fairly intensive workout schedule designed to build muscle as fast as possible so I could stand a fighting chance against my targets and not get torn to pieces in the blink of an eye. By then, I could effectively bench press my body weight with the help of a pound of protein powder every day. I'd also managed to find a remote little shop far from home that sold various old military tools at an affordable price. I accumulated quite the pretty penny over time, so I had completely free range to spend as much as I want on whatever I could conceal. I ended up buying a fantastic vintage olive green army jacket with loads of nifty pockets to store all my tools in and the sharpest looking knife I could find, which was an elegant and exotic kukri knife. Over a foot long with a black handle, this baby looked sharp enough to chop through wood and bone alike, so I paid with cash and headed back home. Was this kukri illegal to carry? Most likely. But I still had no easy access to firearms, nor did I know how to fire one. So for the time being, I was stuck with melee weapons to defend myself. According to the report I got sent in the mail, Hybrid appeared to be some type of roughly humanoid insect creature that stalked the city streets of Dryden in the dead of night. I lived in a rural area, but the city was only an hour-long drive on the highway, so I could get there reasonably quickly. If I'm being honest, Hybrid theory didn't really seem all that imposing. Standing at only 5'6", and described as barely fitting into the baggy gray sweatpants and hoodie it was always seen wearing, I really didn't see why I was told to take this thing out. By my account, it seemed likely that this was just some eccentric manlet who liked to take late-night walks. And I didn't see any mentioning of it being dangerous or hostile to people, but I didn't question the contract and got my gear ready for nighttime. Since I would be roaming the well-lit city streets, I left the night vision goggles at home, and only packed my kukri and flashlight with me. I started keeping the medkits I had in my car, so I was all packed and ready to become a city slicker for the night. I fed my parents another lie about heading out to a friend's place for the night and zipped down the highway, enjoying the cool night breeze on my face. As much as I enjoyed the wind blowing through my long, wavy hair, I felt I should get a haircut. I love the length of my hair, but I'm not very fond of ponytails or buns, and long hair tends to cover your eyes if not properly maintained. Just as I was considering a stop at first choice, I already pulled onto the ramp to get off the highway and get into the city and got an eyeful of the environment. Compared to the brief view I had of pandemonium, the city of Dryden was as drab and dull as plain oatmeal. The ruddy browns of buildings and ugly grays of the roads and sidewalks weren't anywhere near the level of thrilling sights pandemonium had to offer. The sloppy, lazy building shapes all throughout Dryden gave the impression that the entire city was still a work in progress and carried the amateurish appearance of being built by a rookie architect. Each building had flat square roofs and four rectangular walls that didn't line up correctly, which complemented the warped, crumbling sidewalks that hugged the erratic building so tight it seemed like the concrete was fusing to the brick walls. I realized that comparing a drab southern Canadian city to a multi-dimensional sci-fi-looking daytime utopia is hardly fair, but I still felt like it didn't measure up. I navigated the cramped streets and pulled into a well-worn parking lot, paid the dusty parking meter in cash, and started to scout the streets, looking for a short humanoid dressed in baggy gray clothing. Whilst I combed the illuminated streets, I began to think about what exactly I was hunting. The name Hybrid stuck out to me as being both perplexing and unnerving. It was described as being a humanoid insect-like creature, so I instantly thought of the fly and imagined a mutated, gooey fly-human monstrosity roaming the streets, leaving chunks of flesh and ooze behind it 
in a trail of sloppy slime as it dragged its decaying body across the street, bringing great terror for anyone misfortunate enough to gaze at its ugly mug. I tried looking for a dark ally or enclosed space I could hide in to spot out hybrid while being cloaked by night, but I didn't have any luck. The buildings were too close to each other to have any sort of hiding space. While I continued to look, I noticed something a bit odd about the city, something I still don't understand. Dryden looked completely vacant, like no one had lived there in a fair bit of time. I didn't expect such a homey-looking city to be bustling on a cold Wednesday evening, but even the smallest cities and towns had a few people loitering around at night. Hell, even the rural farm town I hunted the dogman at had more people around at night. Despite all the light provided from the rustic street lamps, I couldn't see a person, animal, tree, or anything. I thought to myself, surely this can't be because of hybrid, right? I'm just psyching myself out. Everyone is asleep. I pulled out my phone and the clock read 10.34 p.m. People still have work and school tomorrow, so it makes sense the streets would be dead. At least it makes my job easier. Less people, fewer witnesses. I got tired of looking for an ally to hide in, so I decided to try and scale the wall of one of the buildings and perch myself on the roof and play the waiting game for Hybrid to come outside. The building had a pretty squat, so I didn't have much trouble jumping off from an empty trash can and hopping on the flat roof. I rolled onto the roof and laid flat on top, preparing to scout out any potential sightings of Hybrid. Sadly, the waiting game was still as boring and unintuitive as ever. It's not a game one can really improve at, but only find ways to take shortcuts. And for me, my shortcut was fiddling with my kukri. I swung it around like a baseball bat, holding the grip tightly and hearing the crisp air swooshing around my blade. I tried to swing it around like a lightsaber, but I didn't have enough fitness to look intimidating when I did. After some stretch of time I spent goofing off with my blade, I began to smell something strange approaching from the streets below. I could only describe it as a musty combination of mothballs and copious amounts of cheap perfume. It stuck out like a sore thumb among the damp and homely smells of Dryden, so I poked my head over the ledge of the roof, and sure enough, I saw exactly what the report had detailed. A person cloaked by massively oversized gray baggy sweatpants and hoodies shambling through the streets, shifting from foot to foot like it was drunk. I wasn't expecting to be terribly frightened by hybrid, but seeing it up close was almost comical. From where I was sitting, it looked even shorter than the report said. It claimed it stood at 5'6", but from what I saw it was no bigger than 5'1", barely managing to fit inside the clothes it wore. I was confused as to how the report I was given was off so much by height, but I didn't know who to blame. Boss didn't make these himself, only gave them to me. I continued to watch the clumsy figure stumble across the street, looking completely inebriated. I tried to get a better view of its face, but the gray hood completely obscured it. I was worried that I had spotted a regular person walking instead of my target. I wasn't able to see any of the insect-like features Hybrid was supposed to have, so I was still very much on the fence if I should pounce on it with my knife. My gut was telling me to wait for a quieter opportunity to strike, so I stayed hidden and kept my eyes on the figure. I kept on watching as it walked across the street, but it didn't look like it had anywhere to be specifically. It was moving aimlessly, changing directions and stopping in place seemingly at random. The distant sound of crickets made the figure jump and faced a small patch of grass near a park bench. The gray-clad figure skittered on the ground and collapsed, resting on its hands and knees on the grass, and I finally saw what it looked like. Its hood had flipped back, revealing an uncomfortable mishmash of human and insect features, reinstating my theory of this monster looking like the fly. The figure had greasy brown hair tied into a painfully tight ponytail connected to a gray, scaly scalp that was swamped with moist brown droplets of sweat. Their hands were covered in needle-thin hair with black leathery skin that was as dark as the night sky, with three sharp, pincer-like fingers jabbing at the grass, looking for something. They quickly found their target, the noisy cricket making noise nearby, and plucked it out of the grass, raising the quivering insect above its gross head. It was hard to see this thing's head from the angle it was standing at, but I did catch a glimpse of its massive mosquito-like compound eyes. They were so large that they nearly took up all the space on its already large head, 
leaving maybe a quarter of its face untouched by the two massive spheres. A shiver went down my spine seeing this thing's gangly appearance in all its skin-crawling glory. Hybrid stuffed the squirming insect into its hoodie pocket and flipped its hood back up with its malformed hands, darting towards the street. Christ, that thing was fast. It hit the ground running and bolted so fast that I had trouble even spotting it. It turned a corner with great speed and darted around a small house, and I peered over the side of the roof to see. Hybrid swung open a door behind the squat house and jumped inside, locking the door behind it quickly. I waited a couple more minutes to ensure Hybrid would stay inside that building, and slowly descended from the roof, landing on an old recycling bin on the ground. I quietly paced to the house Hybrid ran inside and pressed my hand against the doorknob, causing it to turn into dust. I pushed the door open slowly and was greeted by the smell of mold and must. I covered my nose with my sleeve and tried to spot Hybrid inside, but the darkness inside the house was hard to see through and I didn't want to potentially draw attention to myself by turning on the lights. I tiptoed through the tiny home, avoiding the rotting furniture and peeling wallpaper scraps on the floor. Was this Hybrid's house, or just some house they happened to occupy for tonight? I knew nothing about Hybrid's sleeping patterns, so I was completely in the dark, metaphorically and literally. I found a small set of stairs and walked upstairs as slowly and precisely as I could, making sure not to cause any creaks. Once I got up the entire staircase, I was met with a tiny white wooden door that positively reeked of that pungent mold smell, mixed with a sickly sweet scent that I had become far too familiar with, the smell of rotting flesh. Hesitating to go inside, I crouched and tried to see underneath the door and saw the outline of something near the door. It was too dark to see, but I could make out a general cone shape suspended in the air. To the left of the cone shape was Hybrid, standing on the room ceiling upside down, clothing discarded and wrapped in two sets of massive, moth-like wings. I felt like I just stumbled upon a golden opportunity. Hybrid looked like it was sleeping, and I was a few steps away from collecting my paycheck. I slid my fingertips against the bottom of the door and rotted the wood until the door formed a hole big enough for me to fit my entire body in and crawled inside. Once I got into the room, I carefully stepped inside the room and shuffled past all the debris on the floor. Piles of what looked like spider silk and various articles of women's clothing were strewn across the floor haphazardly, clustering around a musty mattress on the floor. Once I saw the various clothing articles, some gears started to turn in my head. The file didn't detail Hybrid's gender, but based on its height and the clothes, I could safely assume Hybrid was a female. Despite how old and moldy this place was, it still felt lived in like someone was still occupying inside and living in these measly conditions. It didn't take long for me to put two and two together. Hybrid lived here. It's an uncomfortable thought that a bug monster might be hiding in a nearby house with no one knowing about it, but that's why people have jobs as I do. I snuck up towards Hybrid and wrenched my hands around where her leathery throat was, clenching it tightly as I felt the squirmy flesh harden and crumble between my palms. Unlike the dogman in the previous part, Hybrid didn't wake up from my assault. I kept clenching my hands until both hands began to rub against each other and let go. Her neck was spindly enough for me to know that her vocal cords, I'm assuming she has them, she's still part human, right? Were completely gone, so she couldn't make any cries for help. I sighed deeply and felt like a weight had been lifted off of my back, glad that I was able to finish this task so quickly. Strangely, Hybrid's feet didn't lose any grip from the ceiling she was hanging from, even after what I did to her throat. I tried to check for a pulse on her wrist to confirm if she was dead and felt no movement. Right, she's dead, I thought to myself, preparing to turn around and sneak out. Boss was kind enough to take care of the evidence I left behind from my tasks, so I didn't have to worry about clearing the evidence. Before I left the room, I bumped into the dark cone shape that was suspended from the ceiling. I felt a warm sensation when I touched the shape, and my curiosity was thoroughly piqued. What is this thing? What kind of shit can hybrid hoard in here? I thought to myself. I reached out to touch the anonymous object, making sure not to disintegrate it, and felt a smooth, silky feeling that radiated the same warmth I felt when I bumped into it. It tugged at the shape and stretched a strong piece of silk, which quickly snapped against the shape as I let go. 
I pulled out my kukri and made a careful light slash across the width of the shape and made a horrific discovery. There was the unmistakable outline of a withered, dry human body inside the shape. I stepped back in disgust and nearly dropped my knife on the ground. From the looks of it, Hybrid had wrapped some poor bastard in a silk cocoon and was draining it of all its inner fluids. The body was so dry and mangy that I couldn't even make out the gender. All I could see was an expression of horrible, agonizing shock stuck on its face. Shit. Wasn't here fast enough, I thought to myself, feeling bad for not hunting after Hybrid fast enough. I couldn't tell how long the body had been dead for, but I knew that anybody at all was bad news and that I needed to be faster. I left the house feeling ashamed and drove back home, the horrific expression of the corpse lingering fresh on my mind. Who was that person? What were they doing in that cocoon? Were they minding their old business? Or were they some type of wannabe monster hunter? I know I'll never get an answer for any of these questions, but I ask them anyway. I'm sorry if that tale ended on something of a sour note. It's just that I hate to see people hurt or dead, knowing that I could save them had I been fast enough. But Hybrid was dead, and it was dealt with. All I had to stress about until my next assignment was online schoolwork, so I couldn't mope for too long. Right when I got home, I checked my mail and found four grand in a sealed envelope waiting for me, courtesy of boss. Some time ago, I requested him to send me paper bills instead of direct deposits, just so my family doesn't get suspicious. So that was the tale of Hybrid the Bug Person, I think it's one of my more standard cases, but I felt it was worth typing anyways. I specifically chose a more standard case for the first tale so I could detail how an average hit is played out, so the crazier stories I tell feel as strange to you as they do to me. But the next one won't be quite as successful. This is one of the shitter cases I've done, and it still doesn't sit right with me. Edit. Okay, I think I fucked up. I was planning on uploading the second story, but it seems this site has a character limit that I surpassed. Worst case scenario, I'll just upload the next part tomorrow. I have it all written up, so it won't be much of an issue. See you guys and gals tomorrow with the next part of this story. Take care. Yami, it's been a while, hasn't it? I hope that this submission is enough proof that I didn't get murked on the job, but I feel kind of bad that I've left everyone in the dark for so long. So, as my condolences, I'm going to give everyone two stories. I know I spoil you guys and gals, but how could I not feel so generous when my first part got so much praise? I owe you all something big, and this is my way to thank you. Before I get into my stories, I feel that I need to address something important. I got a comment addressing the whereabouts of the government branch I offhandedly mentioned in my first post, asking me if I was a victim of mind wiping and if I was okay. For those of you who don't know, the old high school I attended was a victim to an absolute paranormal shit show that rocked my worldview and landed me this job in the first place. It started right in the morning during a class of summer school I was in with two other students. We received an emergency weather warning over the intercom during an intense thunderstorm, but the announcement gave us peculiar instructions like not contacting 911 instead of telling us to wait for emergency services to come find us. As I later learned, these emergency services were actually a squadron of highly secretive government agency tasked with eliminating the various monsters that began to roam free in the school. I've yet to ever get an official explanation as to how these monsters even got to our school in the first place, but I'm assuming that they got there like how nearly all monsters get to Earth, through pandemonium, the interdimensional city boss rules over. If you want a good reason as to why people have jobs like mine, this is it. I don't know how many lives were lost that day, nor do I really want to entrench myself in the details. People like me do our best to ensure that this doesn't happen, that regular people don't have to become aware of and die at the hands of things that shouldn't exist in the first place. To summarize the event, all of the survivors were escorted by that government branch and were treated with some type of mind drug or hypnosis. I wasn't there so I don't have a clue as to what they did, and they forgot the entire incident. The story they all told the media was that the extreme weather conditions caused the school to shut down and that various EMS people came in and rescued them. I never saw any firefighters or cops near the school, but it's possible they came later once I and a friend left the school. Nah. I don't know much about the government branch that managed to cover all this up. What I can say for sure is that this was definitely not their first paranormal encounter. 
The few agents I met seemed way too at ease and comfortable for this to be a new experience. I did, however, see a logo that they all seemed to carry around, a patch with three skulls holding a book, fist and a blank board diagram in their mouths respectively. For clarity, I'm going to be referring to this organization as the Skulls until I can find an official name for these jokers. I'm reluctant to search for them on the internet, but the little searching I did held absolutely no results for them. Not a Wikipedia page or even WikiLeaks page in sight. I really wouldn't recommend trying to find any details about them, because their reach and influence is pretty frightening and can land you in some hot water. I had an encounter with them some time ago that I discussed in the comments section, but I'll elaborate here. A couple of days after I escaped the school, my mother heard a knock on the door and found that two strange men as she described them were standing there, looking intimidating and professional. They were wearing matching black suits and sunglasses, so she couldn't tell them apart. They asked her about the weather disaster at the school that occurred and wanted to know how I got home from the event. I lied to mom and said that I drove home as soon as the emergency broadcast played, so that's what she told them. According to her, both of them left in a hurry and drove off right after, and haven't come back since. I don't know how this sounds to anyone reading this, but hearing this recounted by my mother was deeply concerning. They know where I live, and there's probably a good chance they know that I remember everything, making me a target to their insidious mind-wiping. Sadly, the claustrophobic feeling of being watched has stuck with me to this day, putting an enormous amount of pressure on me. For this reason, I always like to cover my tracks, both in the literal sense and the metaphorical sense. I only pay for things in cash, always use a VPN when I'm on the internet, and I try not to give away too many private details about my life, even when I'm typing here. I know I might come off as being paranoid, but I know that my efforts weren't in vain. If I'm not careful, I'll get caught and mind wiped. I managed to escape with someone named Felipe, who at the time was my best friend. In a way, we were survival buddies. We managed to fend off the various monsters roaming in the school and escape the school with the skin off our backs and drove home. Felipe may have been my first and only friend, but he meant so much more to me than that. He was my better half, someone who understood me and accepted me for who I was. I cherished him with the understanding and thoughtfulness of a brother and the Skulls took him away from me. They found him and stole his memory without a second thought, feeding him a lie about a weather phenomenon in place of what really happened that day. When I called him, he didn't recognize me in the slightest, and now wants nothing to do with me. As much as it hurts to lose him, I really think it's for the better. This line of work is dangerous, so the fewer people I associate with, the chance of them being injured or killed is minimized. All around, it was a complete fucking disaster that I don't ever want to go through again. Sorry for going on such a tangent. I just felt like I needed to get some things off my chest. Now that that's over, let's get started with the two tales I have for tonight. Keep in mind that the numbers I list with these targets are in order based on how many I've taken out. Target hash 12. Hybrid. By this point, it's been nearly two months since my first target, so I was considerably more prepared and confident with this contract. I started a fairly intensive workout schedule designed to build muscle as fast as possible so I could stand a fighting chance against my targets and not get torn to pieces in the blink of an eye. By then, I could effectively bench press my body weight with the help of a pound of protein powder every day. I'd also managed to find a remote little shop far from home that sold various old military tools at an affordable price. I accumulated quite the pretty penny over time so I had completely free range to spend as much as I want on whatever I could conceal. I ended up buying a fantastic vintage olive green army jacket, with loads of nifty pockets to store all my tools in, and the sharpest looking knife I could find, which was an elegant and exotic kukri knife. Over a foot long with a black handle, this baby looked sharp enough to chop through wood and bone alike, so I paid with cash and headed back home. Was this kukri illegal to carry? Most likely but I still had no easy access to firearms, nor did I know how to fire one, so, for the time being, I was stuck with melee weapons to defend myself. According to the report, I got sent in the mail. Hybrid appeared to be some type of roughly humanoid insect creature that stalked the city streets of Dryden in the dead of night. I lived in a rural area, but the city was only an hour-long drive on the highway, so I could get there reasonably quickly. If I'm being honest, hybrid theory didn't really seem all that imposing. 
Standing at only 5'6", and described as barely fitting into the baggy gray sweatpants and hoodie it was always seen wearing, I really didn't see why I was told to take this thing out. By my account, it seemed likely that this was just some eccentric manlet who liked to take late-night walks. I didn't see any mentioning of it being dangerous or hostile to people, but I didn't question the contract and got my gear ready for nighttime. Since I would be roaming the well-lit city streets, I left the night vision goggles at home and only packed my kukri and flashlight with me. I started keeping the med kits I had in my car, so I was all packed and ready to become a city slicker for the night. I fed my parents another lie about heading out to a friend's place for the night and zipped down the highway, enjoying the cool night breeze on my face. As much as I enjoyed the wind blowing through my long wavy hair, I felt I should get a haircut. I loved the length of my hair, but I'm not very fond of ponytails or buns, and long hair tends to cover your eyes if not properly maintained. Just as I was considering a stop at first choice, I already pulled onto the ramp to get off the highway and get into the city and got an eyeful of the environment. Compared to the brief view I had of pandemonium, the city of Dryden was as drab and dull as plain oatmeal. The ruddy browns of buildings and ugly grays of the roads and sidewalks weren't anywhere near the level of thrilling sights pandemonium had to offer. The sloppy, lazy building shapes all throughout Dryden gave the impression that the entire city was still a work in progress and carried the amateurish appearance of being built by a rookie architect. Each building had flat square roofs and four rectangular walls that didn't line up correctly, which complemented the warped, crumbling sidewalks that hugged the erratic building so tight it seemed like the concrete was fusing to the brick walls. I realized that comparing a drab southern Canadian city to a multidimensional sci-fi-looking daytime utopia is hardly fair, but I still felt like it didn't measure up. I navigated the cramped streets and pulled into a well-worn parking lot, paid the dusty parking meter in cash, and started to scout the streets, looking for a short humanoid dressed in baggy gray clothing. Whilst I combed the illuminated streets, I began to think about what exactly I was hunting. The name hybrid stuck out to me as being both perplexing and unnerving. It was described as being a humanoid insect-like creature, so I instantly thought of the fly and imagined a mutated, gooey, fly-human monstrosity roaming the streets, leaving chunks of flesh and ooze behind it in a trail of sloppy slime as it dragged its decaying body across the street, bringing great terror for anyone misfortunate enough to gaze at its ugly mug. I tried looking for a dark ally or enclosed space I could hide in to spot out hybrid while being cloaked by night, but I didn't have any luck. The buildings were too close to each other to have any sort of hiding space. While I continued to look, I noticed something a bit odd about the city, something I still don't understand. Dryden looked completely vacant, like no one had lived there in a fair bit of time. I didn't expect such a homey-looking city to be bustling on a cold Wednesday evening, but even the smallest cities and towns had a few people loitering around at night. Hell, even the rural farm town I hunted the dogman at had more people around at night. Despite all the light provided from the rustic street lamps, I couldn't see a person, animal, tree, or anything. I thought to myself, surely this can't be because of hybrid, right? I'm just psyching myself out. Everyone is asleep. I pulled out my phone and the clock read 10.34 p.m. People still have work and school tomorrow, so it makes sense the streets would be dead. At least it makes my job easier. Less people, fewer witnesses. I got tired of looking for an ally to hide in so I decided to try and scale the wall of one of the buildings and perch myself on the roof and play the waiting game for Hybrid to come outside. The building had a pretty squat, so I didn't have much trouble jumping off from an empty trash can and hopping on the flat roof. I rolled onto the roof and laid flat on top, preparing to scout out any potential sightings of Hybrid. Sadly, the waiting game was still as boring and unintuitive as ever. It's not a game one can really improve at, but only find ways to take shortcuts. And for me, my shortcut was fiddling with my kukri. I swung it around like a baseball bat, holding the grip tightly and hearing the crisp air swooshing around my blade. I tried to swing it around like a lightsaber, but I didn't have enough fitness to look intimidating when I did. After some stretch of time, I spent goofing off with my blade. I began to smell something strange approaching from the streets below. I could only describe it as a musty combination of mothballs and copious amounts of cheap perfume. It stuck out like a sore thumb among the damp and homely smells of Dryden, 
so I poked my head over the ledge of the roof, and sure enough I saw exactly what the report had detailed. A person cloaked by massively oversized gray baggy sweatpants and hoodie shambling through the streets, shifting from foot to foot like it was drunk. I wasn't expecting to be terribly frightened by hybrid, but seeing it up close was almost comical. From where I was sitting, it looked even shorter than the report said. It claimed it stood at 5'6", but from what I saw, it was no bigger than 5'1", barely managing to fit inside the clothes it wore. I was confused as to how the report I was given was off so much by height, but I didn't know who to blame. Boss didn't make these himself, only gave them to me. I continued to watch the clumsy figure stumble across the street, looking completely inebriated. I tried to get a better view of its face, but the gray hood completely obscured it. I was worried that I had spotted a regular person walking instead of my target. I wasn't able to see any of the insect-like features Hybrid was supposed to have, so I was still very much on the fence if I should pounce on it with my knife. My gut was telling me to wait for a quieter opportunity to strike, so I stayed hidden and kept my eyes on the figure. I kept on watching as it walked across the street, but it didn't look like it had anywhere to be specifically. It was moving aimlessly, changing directions and stopping in place seemingly at random. The distant sound of crickets made the figure jump and faced a small patch of grass near a park bench. The gray-clad figure skittered on the ground and collapsed, resting on its hands and knees on the grass, and I finally saw what it looked like. Its hood had flipped back, revealing an uncomfortable mishmash of human and insect features, reinstating my theory of this monster looking like the fly. The figure had greasy brown hair tied into a painfully tight ponytail, connected to a gray, scaly scalp that was swamped with moist brown droplets of sweat. Their hands were covered in needle-thin hair with black leathery skin that was as dark as the night sky, with three sharp pincer-like fingers jabbing at the grass, looking for something. They quickly found their target, the noisy cricket making noise nearby, and plucked it out of the grass, raising the quivering insect above its gross head. It was hard to see this thing's head from the angle it was standing at, but I did catch a glimpse of its massive mosquito-like compound eyes. They were so large that they nearly took up all the space on its already large head, leaving maybe a quarter of its face untouched by the two massive spheres. A shiver went down my spine seeing this thing's gangly appearance in all its skin-crawling glory. Hybrid stuffed the squirming insect into its hoodie pocket and flipped its hood back up with its malformed hands, darting towards the street. Christ, that thing was fast. It hit the ground running and bolted so fast that I had trouble even spotting it. It turned a corner with great speed and darted around a small house, and I peered over the side of the roof to see. Hybrid swung open a door behind the squat house and jumped inside, locking the door behind it quickly. I waited a couple more minutes to ensure Hybrid would stay inside that building and slowly descended from the roof, landing on an old recycling bin on the ground. I quietly paced to the house Hybrid ran inside, and pressed my hand against the doorknob, causing it to turn into dust. I pushed the door open slowly and was greeted by the smell of mold and must. I covered my nose with my sleeve and tried to spot hybrid inside, but the darkness inside the house was hard to see through, and I didn't want to potentially draw attention to myself by turning on the lights. I tiptoed through the tiny home, avoiding the rotting furniture and peeling wallpaper scraps on the floor. Was this hybrid's house? or just some house they happened to occupy for tonight. I knew nothing about hybrid sleeping patterns, so I was completely in the dark, metaphorically and literally. I found a small set of stairs and walked upstairs as slowly and precisely as I could, making sure not to cause any creaks. Once I got up the entire staircase, I was met with a tiny white wooden door that positively reeked of that pungent mold smell, mixed with a sickly sweet scent that I had become far too familiar with the smell of rotting flesh. Hesitating to go inside, I crouched and tried to see underneath the door and saw the outline of something near the door. It was too dark to see, but I could make out a general cone shape suspended in the air. To the left of the cone shape was hybrid, standing on the room ceiling upside down, clothing discarded and wrapped in two sets of massive, moth-like wings. I felt like I just stumbled upon a golden opportunity. Hybrid looked like it was sleeping, and I was a few steps away from collecting my paycheck. I slid my fingertips against the bottom of the door, 
and rotted the wood until the door formed a hole big enough for me to fit my entire body in and crawled inside. Once I got into the room, I carefully stepped inside the room and shuffled past all the debris on the floor. Piles of what looked like spider silk and various articles of women's clothing were strewn across the floor haphazardly, clustering around a musty mattress on the floor. Once I saw the various clothing articles, some gears started to turn in my head. The file didn't detail Hybrid's gender, but based on its height and the clothes, I could safely assume Hybrid was a female. Despite how old and moldy this place was, it still felt lived in, like someone was still occupying inside and living in these measly conditions. It didn't take long for me to put two and two together. Hybrid lived here. It's an uncomfortable thought that a bug monster might be hiding in a nearby house with no one knowing about it, but that's why people have jobs as I do. I snuck up towards Hybrid and wrenched my hands around where her leathery throat was clenching it tightly as I felt the squirmy flesh harden and crumble between my palms. Unlike the dogman in the previous part, Hybrid didn't wake up from my assault. I kept clenching my hands until both hands began to rub against each other and let go. And her neck was spindly enough for me to know that her vocal cords, I'm assuming she has them, she's still part human, right? Were completely gone, so she couldn't make any cries for help. I sighed deeply and felt like a weight had been lifted off of my back, glad that I was able to finish this task so quickly. Strangely, Hybrid's feet didn't lose any grip from the ceiling she was hanging from, even after what I did to her throat. I tried to check for a pulse on her wrist to confirm if she was dead and felt no movement. Right, she's dead, I thought to myself, preparing to turn around and sneak out. That boss was kind enough to take care of the evidence I left behind from my tasks so I didn't have to worry about clearing the evidence. Before I left the room, I bumped into the dark cone shape that was suspended from the ceiling. I felt a warm sensation when I touched the shape, and my curiosity was thoroughly piqued. What is this thing? What kind of shit can hybrid hoard in here? I thought to myself. I reached out to touch the anonymous object, making sure not to disintegrate it, and felt a smooth, silky feeling that radiated the same warmth I felt when I bumped into it. It tugged at the shape and stretched a strong piece of silk, which quickly snapped against the shape as I let go. I pulled out my kukri and made a careful, light slash across the width of the shape and made a horrific discovery. There was the unmistakable outline of a withered, dry human body inside the shape. I stepped back in disgust and nearly dropped my knife on the ground. From the looks of it, Hybrid had wrapped some poor bastard in a silk cocoon and was draining it of all its inner fluids. The body was so dry and mangy that I couldn't even make out the gender. All I could see was an expression of horrible, agonizing shock stuck on its face. Shit, wasn't here fast enough, I thought to myself, feeling bad for not hunting after Hybrid fast enough. I couldn't tell how long the body had been dead for, but I knew that anybody at all was bad news and that I needed to be faster. I left the house feeling ashamed and drove back home, the horrific expression of the corpse lingering fresh on my mind. Who was that person? What were they doing in that cocoon? Were they minding their old business or were they some type of wannabe monster hunter? I know I'll never get an answer for any of these questions, but I ask them anyway. I'm sorry if that tale ended on something of a sour note. It's just that I hate to see people hurt or dead, knowing that I could save them had I been fast enough. But Hybrid was dead and it was dealt with. All I had to stress about until my next assignment was online schoolwork, so I couldn't mope for too long. Right when I got home, I checked my mail and found four grand in a sealed envelope waiting for me, courtesy of boss. Some time ago, I requested him to send me paper bills instead of direct deposits, just so my family doesn't get suspicious. So that was the tale of Hybrid the Bug Person. I think it's one of my more standard cases, but I felt it was worth typing anyways. I specifically chose a more standard case for the first tale, so I could detail how an average hit is played out, so the crazier stories I tell feel as strange to you as they do to me. But the next one won't be quite as successful, this is one of the shitter cases I've done, and it still doesn't sit right with me. Edit. Okay, I think I fucked up. I was planning on uploading the second story, but it seems this site has a character limit that I surpassed. Worst case scenario, I'll just upload the next part tomorrow. I have it all written up so it won't be much of an issue. See you guys and gals tomorrow with the next part of this story. Take care.
We've got to stop meeting like this. I was planning to get this part out rapidly, but here I am, late again. Funny how I have enough work ethic to slaughter monsters for a living, but not provide regular updates. Anyways, I've decided that I'd like to change directions somewhat with the type of stories I recount here. The past three have all been about the contracts I receive and how I go about them, but that's far from the only thing I've done in this line of work. I think there's plenty of interesting stories to tell outside of the actual killing job itself. So let me elaborate and give you a better glimpse into what my working life consists of. Just as a side note, I did get that meeting with boss I mentioned at the end of the last part, and it went superbly. He was so appreciative that I was able to complete my tasks, despite being given such lackluster information on my targets, that he gave me a couple of weeks off of work to sort through and iron out the issues with the reports he was giving me. I desperately wanted to voice my opinions and tell him that a mandatory vacation won't be necessary, but I know better than to try and talk back to boss. At that point in my life, I dedicated myself entirely to fulfilling contracts and doing schoolwork. I don't really have any hobbies or interests to speak of. They're nothing more than a waste of my time. I used to be a big reader, but ever since I got employed reading reminds me too much of work for me to enjoy it. It's hard to get engrossed in a book when you can hear the guttural shrieks of agony and the hissing of my disintegration ability replayed over and over again in your head. Not that I'm really complaining, though. I have all the time in the world to get my job done and make boss proud, which is all I could really ask for. I didn't want to spend a few weeks sleeping until this vacation is over, so I tried to drive around and find somewhere to occupy my time. I don't live near many places for young guys like me to hang out, but I tried anyway. Needless to say, it was a monumental failure. I found going to the cinema a pricey chore that ultimately left me unsatisfied and annoyed at the lackluster customer service when I bought a bag of popcorn and my drink. Once I left the theater, I just decided to drive around the town until my gas ran low so I could burn time. It wasn't a very fun way to spend the day, but it beats being cooped up at home. I couldn't help but feel annoyed that this forced sabbatical was taking away from my critically important duty of killing the things that go bump in the night. I know I sound like a broken record, but I still trusted what boss has planned for me. So I did my best to take it all in stride and come back to work better than ever. Or at least that was my game plan. I'll admit, I didn't follow my own advice for the first couple of days. My rigorous workout routine waxed, and my normally airtight diet was gone in the wind, with cheap burgers and gas station hot dogs filling the void it left inside me. As you could imagine, I was completely miserable. Days and days without working made me realize just how meaningless life can get when you don't have a purpose. If I'm not able to do my job, then what's the point? That's all there is to my name, and that's all there will ever be. I know that sounds grim, but it's the honest truth. I was like this for maybe a week or two, and it was one of the toughest weeks I've had in a while. Thankfully, I was able to get out of this depressing funk, but not in the way I would ever expect. <laughs> it happened around halfway through this sabbatical, and I was feeling as miserable as can be. I was at a gas station in God knows where, casually pumping gas into my car, snacking on a gas station deli sandwich. It tasted more like rubber than the ham and cheese it was supposed to, but I was long past the point of caring what my food tasted like. Had it not been for the chilly wind, I might have just fallen asleep right then and there. I loved my spiffy army jacket, but it was by no means a warm coat, and the wind cut through my layers like a knife. Just as the nozzle clicked and stopped pumping gas, I heard the doors of the mart beep open and shut with an electronic click. Two people exited the mart, one of which, a female, was holding a dark backpack, presumably chock full of items purchased from the mart. They both looked at me, pumping my gas, and strode towards me, looking like they were going to interrogate me for something. The girl carrying the bag had her hair dyed an eye-searing shade of minty green, which made it hard to focus on the expression she had when she came towards me. The other figure, a dark-skinned youthful man, had his hands shoved into his worn bright orange puffer jacket pockets, smiling a cocky grin like he was remembering some type of inside joke I wasn't aware of. Already I could tell I wasn't going to like whatever conversation we were going to have. Even before I started working I never really lived for social interaction. I preferred my own company instead. It doesn't help that I was already in a sour mood to begin with. Hey, can we talk for a bit, mate? Asked the male, his thick British accent making itself apparent. I closed my fuel door and faced them both, 
finishing my sandwich with a final clumsy bite. Sure, what's up? I said, trying to sound disinterested and dry, hoping he would take the hint and leave me alone. He motioned to the girl beside him, and she dug out a leather journal from the giant backpack, and my ears perked up in curiosity. As much as I wish it was, I knew that that journal wasn't just any nice-looking journal. It was a special one given by Boss to his employees. It looks just like any other, but something in my brain just screamed, This is my journal. There are many others like it, but this is mine. The contents inside were a list of every proxy he hired in this area. He said, presumably meaning Canada. I never bothered to ask whether this area actually meant out the country or not, but I feel like I knew what he was implying. It wasn't a small book either. There was a fair amount of pages on it, so clearly Boss has a preference in who he hires. The most concerning part of that reveal was trying to figure out how he got his hands on that journal. The easy explanation would be that he's a fellow employee, but I just wasn't totally convinced he was. He and the girl beside him lacked the professional and dangerous aura I had come to expect from someone in my line of work. Up until that point, I hadn't actually met any co-workers, so I was less than impressed with what I saw. The man dressed in orange flipped through the book casually, skipping every page until he reached one of the very last pages at the end of the book, then turned it around and showed me the pages, where I saw my own name written in full. This is you, right? You're Jaime Spears? He asked, exhaling a thick cloud of smoke from the crisp winter air. There are a few things I regret doing when I first agreed to become a proxy killer, and signing my full name to boss was one of them. I could have just as easily told him some random nickname and gotten the job all the same, but I didn't think ahead and signed with my real name, meaning that anyone can find me pretty easily, co-worker or not. Who's asking? I responded, trying to cover my freezing lips with my jacket. The man smiled and handed the book back over to the green-haired girl, who shoved it back inside the bag. Hey, don't worry about it, mate. I'm a proxy just like you. We've been working for boss for a couple of years now, you can call me Orion, he said, dusting off the shoulder of his coat. I didn't initially recognize that name from my leather booklet, but afterward I did end up checking it, and sure enough, both he and the girl beside him were right there on the pages. Both were listed with a first name only, which means I had to accept they were more prepared than I was when they first signed up. Shit, I forgot the Doritos. Don't tell him anything yet, I'll be back in a second, the green hair girl said marching back into the shop to grab what she was apparently missing. Was a bag of nacho chips really worth holding off this conversation? I thought to myself, feeling a little peeved, that I had to wait even longer to get this conversation over. That's Amira, my roommate and proxy partner. She's kinda scatterbrained, but she's a hard worker, Orion said, smiling brightly. Abandoning us for Doritos didn't give me the strongest impression, but whatever. I just had to take his word for it. I stood there and shivered in the cold, but Orion looked completely calm like the frosty breeze wasn't even there. So how long you been working? He asked me quietly, briefly eyeing around the gas station, checking for anyone else that could be around us. A couple of months, I said dryly. I didn't bother asking him the same question because I really didn't care. Unfortunately, he didn't seem to take the hint and continued to talk anyway. I knew you were a rookie, but I didn't think you were that new he said, sounding like he was vaguely mocking me. I've been doing jobs for boss for a couple of years now, but I've hardly got any action compared to the others. Hell, I've gone on like one mission in the last month, and even on those monthly missions I barely have to try. I just get in and get out, he said, laughing with a low, throaty chuckle. One mission in a month. Had I still been eating my gas station sandwich, I might have dropped it out of shock. How in God's name this clown was getting by with such a low amount of hits was... You go on one mission a month? I've been doing them bi-weekly at the worst of times, and weekly on busier times. Why would boss even hire you in the first place? I stated, hoping to make myself sound mean and get him to start taking his job more seriously. From what little he said to me, I believe that he isn't really putting his 100% in it like I was, and I feel that I need to give him a metaphorical kick in the pants to stop him from being lazy. Orion's smile dropped off his face and he shot me an expression that was confusion, anger, and curiosity all at once. His eyes squinted and his forehead furrowed. Have you been taking our hits? He said, sounding deadly quiet. I have no real way to confirm or deny his suspicion, so I was in a tight spot. I've never seen or heard of him or Amira before, so I was doubtful. 
Before I could give any answer, Amira rushed out of the store, tightly clutching the straps of her backpack. Okay, I got everything we need, now we can talk, she said, huffing and puffing like she was out of breath. Orion and I exchanged an uneasy look with each other, but we kept our mouths shut. I already knew he didn't like me, but that's not my concern. If boss has him doing a monthly task in my area compared to my countless tasks, then I struggle to see him as anything other than some Mooka proxy intern, if you will. I could tell that his expression was saying, we'll talk about this later, and I tried giving him the same message. Amira noticed us pointing daggers at each other and spoke up. Come on, I was there for like five minutes. Have you guys not made any small talk? She questioned, a sly grin stretching across her face. Was buying chips really more important than this? I asked her, looking for a way out of staring at Orion. She looked at me confused. Buy? She said, raising an eyebrow at me. Did you not go to the store to buy chips? No. She licked her lips for a few seconds, then her eyes lit up. Oh, that's what you meant. No, I stole this. She said casually, and my breath caught in my throat. First, they tell me they work once a month and now they're stealing food from gas stations? With every passing second, I continued to wonder how these two even got hired in the first place. Boss specifically said to me that he's looking for positive qualities in his employees, which neither of these two had. Why are you stealing from a gas station? How do you expect to react when they catch you in the act? I scolded her, sounding more like a cop than I really intended to. She lazily shrugged her shoulders. Trust me, I'm not getting caught anytime soon, she said with a wink, nudging her arm to Orion who couldn't help but chuckle. Yeah, we're pretty good at our job, stealing that is. He elaborated. I wanted to say something about their theft habit, but at this point I had more important conversation topics to dredge through. So what's up? Why did you two want to talk to me? I asked them. No. Well, we're trying to really branch out and meet our fellow co-workers. We've been employed for like three years now, and we've only gotten to see a handful of hits. Now that we both have more free time than ever, we can finally do that. Mind if we ask you some questions? Orion said, sounding excited. I wasn't really sure what I was expecting, but an interview wasn't very high on my imaginary list of my first encounters with my co-workers. Sure, I guess. Ask away, I said nonchalantly. Orion and Amira shared an excited look, but that quickly faded and turned into one of concern. Can we ask for a favor from you? Amira asked, eyes glued to the ground. Yeah. I nodded my head, preparing to accommodate whatever they asked. Do you mind if we bum a ride off of you? She asked sheepishly, rocking from side to side like her request was particularly embarrassing for her to say. At first I was a bit confused because I assumed they drove here on their own, but the gas station was devoid of any cars other than my own. You don't have a car. Did you two walk the whole way here? I asked, struggling not to laugh over the idea of the two of them walking for God knows how long just to reach a gas station. Amira's face flushed and she somehow looked more sheepish and shy than before. Stop laughing. It's cold out here and Orion won't share any of his powers with me. Please just give us a ride. She squeaked, hugging herself to try and conceal some level of warmth. I'll be honest. Talking to these two made me forget they most likely had superpowers in the same way I did. They just seemed too normal to have them. They didn't feel like proxies to me. Even now, I struggle to see Boss choosing them and granting them their own abilities. Orion's grin grew wider, and he scratched his short, curly black hair. You know more than anyone that my powers only work through contact. All you had to do was ask me to hug you for it to work, he said, stretching his arms out wide like he was bracing for when she jumped into his arms to activate his powers, whatever they may be. No, stop suggesting lewd things like that, Amira mumbled trying to hide her blushing face underneath her black sweater. All right, fine. Get in the car and tell me where you want me to drop you off, I said, sounding defeated. Orion shot me a thumbs up and they both walked towards my car, and we all hopped in. Orion leaped into the passenger seat, and Amira flopped down on the back seats. We all buckled up and I entered the location Orion gave me into my GPS and started following the path laid out for me, eager to drop these two off and hopefully never have to speak to them again. Obviously, they aren't as annoying as the creatures I'm tasked to kill on a regular basis, but my antisocial nature was screaming at me to avoid these two. The address they gave me was an apartment complex situated maybe 20 minutes via drive, which makes the fact that they walked here all the more amusing. For the first couple of seconds, we all sat in silence, 
listening to the sounds of my car's well-worn engine buckling in the snowy roads. It was a surreal type of quiet outside, where no animals dared to make a sound to interrupt the ominous emptiness of the world around us. Not a single streetlight was present, and no trees stood by us. It was just completely flat, snow-covered land surrounding us. I may have been in the car with two other people, but I felt completely alone. You mind turning on the radio or something? It's kinda awkward without something to listen to, Orion requested. No can do, radio's broken. I have a couple of CDs in my console if you want to choose one, I suggested. Most of my CDs were worn old alternative rock bands that kids used to listen to back in the early 2000s. I have no idea what Orion's music taste is, but it wouldn't surprise me if he turned off a Blink-182 album. After a few seconds of flipping through CD cases, he huffed and slammed the console shut. Since your music taste is complete garbage, let's just cut to the chase, okay? He said, a clear undertone of annoyance in his voice. Normally I'd try and refute someone disrespecting my music taste, but I really couldn't be bothered to care anymore. Sure, whatever. Ask away. Orion licked his lips and cleared his throat. How did you first get hired as a proxy? He questioned. Summer school, I said offhandedly, not fully registering the question. Once he gave me a perplexed glance, I knew I had to elaborate. I went to class and it was being overrun by a bunch of monster escapees from Pandemonium. Boss scouted me and hired me based on a bunch of favorable qualities he said he saw in me. Bravery, heroism, etc. Since then, I've been working for him. How's that? I was expecting him to be satisfied, but both he and Amira had a look of concern on their faces. Jesus, during school? I knew Boss liked to hire young faces, but I didn't think he'd go that young, Orion mumbled, sounding deeply troubled. Young. I'm 17 and that's hardly young at all. How old are you two? I asked. 20, they said together. Don't mind him, we're just not used to working with kids, Amira remarked, and Orion muffled a chuckle. Who are you calling kid? I'm like, only a couple of years younger than you. And besides, this kid gets more contracts than both of you combined, I said, hoping that statement stung them both. Amira was laughing in the back, but Orion gave me a hard sneer. Watch your mouth, pretty boy. We've been in this business longer than you have he said, his grin revealing his bright white teeth. He didn't sound all that upset when I mentioned his lack of contracts compared to me, so I guess he was already over it. As if being called a kid wasn't insulting enough, being called pretty boy felt like a slap in the face. I'm a lot of things, but certainly not pretty, at least not enough to be mocked for it. Amira burst into side-splitting laughter at that nickname and wanted to shrink into my seat and not be anywhere near these two. I mean, it's true. You want to tell me what kind of eyeliner you wear? Your lashes are longer than mine. She snickered in between hefty breaths. I knew she was only trying to give me shit for an innocent laugh, but I couldn't help but feel a little humiliated. For the record, I do not wear eyeliner and I don't have long eyelashes. Not that long, at least. Trying to change the topic, I asked both of them a question. How did you two get recruited? I waited for their snickering to die down. Then they gave me their answer. I got recruited before she did back when I was living in the UK. Orion elaborated. I think I was at the market having myself an early morning jog. I was minding my own business when I happened to spot an older looking guy sitting by the edge of a dock, just relaxing. Normally, I wouldn't have paid him any mind. But that was until this absolutely massive eel looking creature just snapped him up and dragged him under the water like it was the most casual thing in the world. I ran down to the docks, but all I could see was a puddle of red slowly growing bigger. Some wild shit, no? The way he phrased the story sounded like he was more focused on the spectacle of it all rather than the fact that he was a witness to a murder. I ran off trying to look for someone to help me, but when I started running there was this gross inky black symbol all over the ground. You know what I'm talking about, right? The inky black symbol was something my boss liked to tag around people he has his eye on, and at that point he started paying attention to Orion. From there, Orion explained that when he opened the door of a community center, he found himself standing in Boss's office when Boss propositioned him for the job. He took it, and the rest is history. Overall, it was noticeably more mundane than my recruitment story, but I've come to believe that mine is just particularly strange among others. I looked back at Amira, 
who was munching on handfuls of that precious Doritos bag she stole and decided to ask her a question. What about you? What's your origin? She glanced at me and gave me an uneasy look and she started to chew her food slowly, like each bite was done with careful consideration. Finally, she swallowed her meal. I'm sorry, I don't really want to talk about it. She said, then continued to stuff her face with nacho chips. She sounded acutely melancholic with her answer, so whatever her origin may be, it couldn't be good. Let me ask you this, what's your superpower? Orion interjected, reaching his hand behind the seat to grab a few chips from Amira's bag. I think I could do a good enough job explaining it, but I was feeling flashy and wanted to do something special. You got a coin or something? I asked, which made him dig into his jeans pocket and pluck out a dirt-covered quarter. Carefully steering my car with one hand, I used my free hand to grasp the coin and dissolve it, turning it into what looked like dart ash. Orion's eyes widened in surprise and Amira coughed on her chips. Holy shit, you can dissolve things? That's so cool, she said between choking on cheesy chip crumbs. I flicked the remaining ash off my fingers, adjusted the collar of my jacket. I mean, I guess. I'm sure you have something cooler, I said, hoping they would both show me their powers. Orion rubbed his hands together and smiled a mischievous smile. Say no more. I'll show you right here what I can do, he said pridefully. He shoved his hands back into his pockets and sank back into his seat like he was waiting for something to happen. The car was silent from then on as we waited for something to happen, which gave me time to check the GPS to see how close I was to the location. The barren snowy fields were gone and replaced by gray and brown concrete apartment complexes linked with each other forming one unappealing block of living quarters. I could see a closed shopping mall and various stores in the distance. All of their neon signs were as dark as day. Do you feel it yet? Orion asked, avidly awaiting my response. I tried waving my hand around in the car, looking around my seat, even sniffing the air, but I couldn't spot any real changes inside the car. I thought he was just baiting me for a reaction and didn't activate his powers at all. What am I supposed to see here? What are you doing? Are you sure you don't notice anything? Nothing at all? He said, his sly tone sneaking into his voice. I waited for something to happen again, but still nothing. It was starting to get stuffy in the car, so I went to crank off the heat, but noticed it was already turned off. Figured it out? He said, sounding immensely self-satisfied. You make things hot? I sighed, sounding thoroughly unimpressed. I wasn't sure what to expect with him. But being a glorified air conditioner was not really something I'd picture as being a particularly threatening power to execute monsters with. I still really troubled to imagine these two, or more so Orion specifically, going on jobs and taking out monsters. I guess that's why Boss gives him such a light load. I guess he noticed my lack of excitement because he looked pretty offended. Hey, don't write me off yet. You have no idea how useful this power is? He cried pulling out his hand from his jacket pocket and revealing that it was glowing as bright orange as his coat, like it was a cartoon kettle overheating. I mean, I don't doubt that it can be useful in some situations, but if it works anything like my power, it just seems like a less effective version of what I can do. I'd rather be able to instantly disintegrate something via touch, rather than slowly heat something and still require contact. The GPS told me that I was only one kilometer away from the location, so I began to speed up and turn into the parking lot. All right, you're here, now get out of my car. Orion chuckled and gently punched my shoulder, and I felt the hot sting of his orange-tinted hand. I recoiled in pain and jumped in my seat. Amira rolled off her seat and grabbed her massive backpack full of stolen snacks. Thanks for the ride, mate, I owe you, Orion said cheerfully. I gave him an obligatory smile of acknowledgement and rolled up his window. Amira tapped me on my shoulder and handed me a slip of paper, with both of their phone numbers written on it. Keep those just in case. You don't know when things can get hairy and you'll need our help, she reassured. I wasn't planning on calling them anytime soon, but I appreciated the offer nonetheless. I slipped the note into my jacket pocket and Amira hopped out of the door and closed it, and both of them started walking towards the complex. Just as I was pulling out of the lot, I heard Amira shouting at me. Thanks for the ride, pretty boy. I white knuckle gripped the steering wheel as I drove off. Sorry if my first meeting with my coworkers felt a little mundane, but that was the story in full. It's weird to think that these people are just regular people beneath it all. 
and I think in retrospect I owe those two a lot. They may appear incompetent, but those two had quite an effect on me. Hell, I didn't even notice that my mood was lifted significantly when I talked to them. They certainly aren't boring. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday season this year, and got to relax and eat gingerbread cookies for days on end, because I'm about to completely spoil the Christmas mood with this here story. It's the holiday season, so I decided to tell the most Christmas-themed story I had. A couple of things to note with this tale. Since this took place sometime after the last part, the sabbatical I had was lifted, and I was free to start working again. Secondly, if this part seems to come out of left field and doesn't really connect with the previous parts, it's because it interrupted the plan I had for updates. I was going to gradually give out my favorite stories, and then start documenting the newest hits I do, but the order's been scrambled beyond belief. So without further ado, here's today's story. As much as I'd like to enjoy the holiday season, there's a lot of nasty factors that always manage to make me forget the family festivities I enjoyed as a child and focus more on the cold bitterness of winter. My family's always had a rough time with this time of year. Without going into too much detail, a tragic death in the family completely shattered any semblance of a family dynamic we had, leaving the ruins of Christmas in its wake. Outside of my parents, none of my family has any intention to speak with me in the slightest when they were willing to attend. Now, they don't even bother to show up, leaving our stockings vacant and our mistletoe dry. It was tough to swallow as a kid, but at this age, I'm more or less numb to it. My parents, however, aren't as accepting. I'm sure they hold some type of internal grudge against me, because they're especially cold this time of the year. We don't buy any gifts for each other. We don't take any time off. No tree is present in the house, nor do we really acknowledge the holidays. It's just an extended weekend for us. A cold, bitter weekend. Not that I can blame them, really. It was kind of my fault that our family is as fractured as it is, and I'm long past thinking I deserve any presents from anyone. Not to flaunt my wealth, but I've got enough money to buy essentially anything I could reasonably want. It's the small perks like that that makes being a hitman all the more worth it. Needless to say, the holidays are a grim time at the Spears household. It all came to a culmination on the 24th, when my mother was hanging up stockings by our fireplace. Nothing ever goes in there, so why she puts them up is beyond me and accidentally hung up my sister's stocking out of habit. It's been years since she died, but that opened the wound nonetheless. She was hysterical, and nothing I said reached her in that volatile, angered state. She used me to vent and said that God took the wrong kid, referring to my sister, but I won't hold that against her. She started to throw Christmas ornaments at me in a blind rage, but they didn't hurt too much. My father had to come in and console her by taking a drive to some location I'm not privy to. This happened more than I'd like to admit. Mom freaks out, Dad takes her for a drive, then it's three days before I see either of them. On the plus side, it gives me more time to work and take on hits, but that also means I have to depend on my lackluster cooking skills to eat meals. One can only eat so many boxes of craft dinner before they start to go nutty. After they left, I resigned myself to pick up all the discarded ornaments and withdraw in my room to my laptop mindlessly browsing the internet until I take my sleeping pill and pass out. Aside from vigorous exercise and the occasional Brazilian jiu-jitsu sessions I go to in the YMCA in a handful of towns over, it's crazy how many activities you can do there. Village people weren't lying when they said it was fun to stay there. That's about all I do in my free time. After maybe an hour of watching whatever YouTube chose to recommend to me, I decided to check the mail for any regular packages or bills. I put on my jacket and boots, marched past the ice and opened the frozen over mailbox. To my surprise, there was an envelope from Boss stuffed neatly inside, covering a wad of bills sharing the mailbox. I wasn't really expecting a hit to be given to me on the holidays, but I wasn't complaining. Taking the content inside, I eyed the page given to me. Target hash 54. Krampus. Krampus is one bad motherfucker. Firstly, he only comes in the night of Christmas Eve, dressing up as a ghoulishly deformed Santa Claus and dropping through the chimneys of unsuspecting families, leaving wrapped presents underneath their trees. Once morning comes, both children and parents alike are surprised to find a present that they didn't wrap, but that surprise quickly turns to terror when the present in question turns out to be a fiery bomb that scorches them and their home. If that wasn't scary enough, Krampus himself could tear you to shreds without even trying. 
There were a handful of pictures and a well-written description of what the beast looked like, and the thought of him was ghastly. He was a nine-foot-tall beast with spiky, scaly skin, like a crocodile made out of barbed wire. It stood upright with hooves as black as night. Each one of his fingernails and the horns perched on its goat-like head was a spiraling, twisting mass of nail and bones, snaking in and out of each other like a Chinese finger trap. He wears a cartoonishly contrasting coat to match his cruel twist on Christmas. Santa Claus's signature belt buckle red jacket, complete with a matching crimson back perched on his shoulder, sagging down to the ground, full of horrid contraptions lying dormant. The report didn't know how he was able to get a hold of such items, but that didn't matter. All that mattered was that I murk him before he strikes again in the evening before Christmas. Sometime later that day, I left my house with my kukri in hand and drove to where I needed to be, a couple neighborhoods away. The report instructed me that I had to keep a close eye on the multiple houses at once, because Krampus strikes totally randomly. There's no telling which house has a bomb hidden among its presents until it's too late. I parked my car by the edge of the cozy, snowy town and waited, using a pair of binoculars I brought to give me the best view possible. I switched from scanning the streets to scanning the roofs, and sometimes even gazing up at the dark, clear sky, half expecting a grisly herd of skeletal caribou pulling the monstrous goat Santa across the land, spreading terror wherever he goes. One hour of observing quickly became two, then three, and afterward time seemed to lose all effect on me. It was cold enough to keep me from sleeping, but the relative comfort of my car seat was genuinely tempting at the moment. Before I was able to consider closing my eyes for just a moment, the sound of soft snow crunching caught my attention, and I peered through my tinted window. Cloaked in the darkness, a monstrous outline of a bright red coat could be seen sulking in the night, lugging around a bag nearly as big as its body, struggling to carry the writhing contents inside. My heart felt like it had been gripped in ice when I saw the beast's hooves in the snow, and I knew at that moment what I was looking at. Krampus, I said in a haze. A sharp exhale stung my lungs as I let out frosty air. Just looking at this creature was mesmerizing in a strange, unworldly way. Watching it stumble in the snow and chafe with the bag it was holding was surreal with its goat legs and head, acting as if it were a man. The pictures I saw prior didn't do justice to this creature's unsightly appearance. The goat head it had looked almost twisted on its neck, like someone over-tightening a screw. Its horns were somewhat obscured by the goofy holiday sock hat it wore, but the spiraling black appendages still looked sharp enough to slash my skin like wet paper. I shook myself out of my shock and tightly gripped my blade, softly exiting my car from the passenger side and ducking underneath it. My game plan was to sneak up on it and disintegrate its throat before it gets inside, but all the snow around me was problematic. I wouldn't be able to even walk near it without the crunching of snow giving my position away, so I had to take extra precaution. I poked my finger at the snow, watching it dissolve in chunks as soon as I touched it, and crept along the now visible grass. The snow around me slowly turned into ash, and with each step, my heartbeat tightened. As I kept melting a path towards me, I could see Krampus starting to examine a nearby house, looking around at its frozen windows and closely prodding at the dangling Christmas lights. Finally, he got an idea and began to scale the side of the house, jabbing his claws into the wall, like some type of goat Spider-Man. I managed to reach the lawn of the home when Krampus managed to get himself on the roof and then on top of the chimney. He's really going all the way here. I mean the chimney? He's not even going to fit, I thought to myself, confused as to why it wouldn't do something easier like just open the door. Krampus's bag was an easy enough fit down the chimney and landed inside the house with a muted thud. Krampus himself was another story. He was far too wide to even begin to fit inside the chimney, so he struggled his furry body against the brick square entrance. While he tried to wedge himself out from the chimney, I carefully grabbed the splinters his hooves and claws made in the side of the house and scaled it, careful to make as little noise as possible. It didn't notice me as I hobbled on the roof, blade in my hand. As I crept closer, I came to the conclusion that Krampus's neck was far too thick for me to grab and dissolve before he would take a swing at me, so I had to put my faith into my kukri and stab him directly in the head to kill him. The sound of his claws scraping the brick and his guttural bleats muted my unsteady footsteps 
which gave me a window of time to slash at his skull and hopefully kill him before he notices me. Quietly pacing towards him, the foul smell of gunpowder and smoke emanating off his jet black fur became apparent and my eyes watered slightly. I readied my arms around my blade and went to jab my blade in his skull, but an unexpected shift of his neck slightly knocked me off balance, making the blade scrape against his scalp, drawing a grisly red line along his fur. Krampus snorted in pain, and the whole roof felt like it was shaking. He turned his head towards me, and I got a full look at his slit pupils, now shaking with rage. Just seeing him was uncomfortable, but starting at him eye to eye felt so persecuting, like he was trying to judge if I was worthy of having a nitroglycerin-laced present in my stocking. From the looks of it, I deserved several bombs. He snarled and climbed out of the chimney, brandishing his spiraling claws. I became aware of the howling wind as the two of us had our silent stare down, waiting for the other to make the first move. I, however, was not prepared to have a melee duel with Krampus. Stealth is kind of my bread and butter, and I'm not one to adventure past my comfort zone. Despite the cold, my palms started to sweat as I gripped my blade anticipating Krampus to make the first move so I could slash at him and throw him off the roof. My hip toss move wasn't something I've had the chance to practice on another living person, or goat for that matter, but I'll try my damnedest to do it. Finally, Krampus made a baritone-esque growl and lunged at me, prepared to disembowelment with his claws. I acted on instinct and sidestepped him, managing to slash at his furry claws and position myself beside him where I grit my teeth and prayed for my hysterical strength to kick in as I grabbed him and prepared to throw him off the roof. I became acutely aware of how much heavier he was than me, but I persisted managed to lift him off his hooves. I roared with anger as I managed to lift him and threw him just far enough for him to topple off the roof and slam into the ground, where the sounds of snapping bones and bleeding followed. I felt lightheaded and fell to my knees on the roof, feeling the urge to pass out after overexerting myself like that, but I crawled to the edge of the roof and saw the state Krampus was in. His twisting horns had embedded into the dirt and snow, and he was stuck. He struggled to move at all, what with his head nearly stuck in the dirt. I huffed and did my best to carefully climb down the roof, using the dents he made to hold my footing steady. Krampus started to bleat which made me worry that people would notice the sound and start to wake up, so I had to act fast. I brandished my blade and jammed it directly into the middle of his skull, which promptly silenced his bleats. He slowly stopped struggling and his body laid limp in that awkward position, finally dead. I dropped my blade and nearly passed out, the stress and panic of flipping him off the roof finally setting in. After a few minutes of me trying to catch my breath, I came to the realization that I couldn't just keep his corpse here out in public, I had to get rid of it. Normally boss disposes of it for me, but I couldn't afford to wait around and guess when he'll come around to doing it, so I paced back to my car and retrieved a can of black spray paint I kept inside the trunk. I sprayed a symbol next to Krampus, a symbol that would ensure that my boss would pay attention and take high priority with corpse disposal. I finished spraying it and threw the can and my kukri into the trunk and had to get one last thing from the house, Krampus's bomb-ridden bag. I was thinking about just using the front door if it were unlocked and sneaking it out, but the house he had deposited it in came alive with a flickering light, and my exhausted heart dropped. Through the drawn curtains I could barely make out the form of a child wandering in the home, clutching something tightly to their chest. Shit, I have to act fast. At that moment I thought of something so wildly improbable and stupid that it just might work. The fact that a child was the potential witness in question gave me an idea and I didn't have the luxury of careful planning. I snatched Krampus's big sock hat and finagled his belt buckle red coat and put it on. Both were comically oversized for me, but I wore it anyway. I rescaled the walls and made it on top of the roof, where I crossed my fingers and jumped down the chimney, liking going down a pipe in Mario. As soon as I hit the bottom, I felt the sting of landing ass first on wood and struggled to crawl out of the chimney. The house I landed in was a cozy-looking one. The tree was brightly lit up with a multitude of colored bulbs and adorned with countless tiny framed photographs of a family, a mother, a father, and a young girl. All underneath the tree were presents of various sizes, all of which were wrapped in bright red wrapping paper marked, From Santa. Given that I just had to kill Krampus, the possibility of these presents actually coming from Saint Nick 
wasn't something I could rule out. I quickly retrieved the bag sitting on the floor and struggled to lift it over my shoulder. Just as I got it to stay, I saw the little girl who was pictured in the tree photographs clutching a plush doll of Santa. Her eyes lit up even brighter than the tree behind me, and she rushed over to me with glee. Santa, it's really you, she squealed, hugging me tightly. It's been a long time since I've seen anyone who's reminded me of my late sister, and I was in no way prepared to reminisce on those memories. Regardless, I put on the outfit for one reason. Tricking the kid into thinking I'm actually Santa rather than a hitman. It wasn't going to be easy, but I had to do it. Of course, child. It's on this day I have to deliver presents to all the good boys and girls of the world, I said quietly, doing my best to sound jolly. She looked up at me with glee and eyes full of wonder, an expression I haven't seen in nearly a decade on anyone. Now you know you should be asleep by now, right? I must deliver all the presents at night, and this is far too late for someone like you to be up, I said, trying to strike a balance between sounding gentle and sounding commanding. The little girl frowned at me and pouted. I'm sorry, Santa, I was just so excited, she mumbled. I smiled and rubbed her shoulder. It's all right, child, let's put you to bed, I said, telling her to lead me to her bedroom. I put the bag down and carried the little girl to the room she pointed towards and placed her on the bed. She quickly pulled the covers over herself and put her head on the pillow. Good night, Santa, she said in between yawns, holding the plush doll close to her. At that precise moment, I felt a rush I haven't truly felt in years, like I had rediscovered a sense of accomplishment that was lost to me. Simply appealing to a child's joy was accomplishing enough, but it only hit me then that I had just saved her and her family's lives. Had I been unable to take care of Krampus, they would be charred by tomorrow. I want this, I thought, I want this feeling. It felt fantastic to keep this family safe and happy, but I couldn't help but acknowledge a sense of longing I had to have the same thing. I wish my family was like this. I wish I could still protect them. I wish we were all together. I quickly left the room and went back into the living room with the tree, lifted the sack over my shoulder, and unlocked the door from the inside. I closed it and left the house, noticing that Krampus was already gone. Thanks, boss. I threw the sack into the back seat and drove off, still wearing the Santa suit. When I pulled into the driveway, it was still empty. I felt neutral about it beforehand but now it made me feel lonelier than ever. I knew it was childish, but I wished I had someone dressed as Santa comfort me when I was the age of that little girl. I wanted to feel safe and loved, and not feel the weight of me destroying my family dynamic with my cowardice. Where was my Santa? I solemnly dragged me and my gift sack out, retrieved my cash from the mailbox, and went inside my room. I wasn't interested in opening any bombs. So I left the bag alone and kept it inside my closet, where it sits even to this day. Maybe someday I'll try and open one, but for now, I'll keep it there. I didn't even check how much money I got for killing Krampus. I just threw the envelope into a box I kept under my bed and took off the oversized Santa gear. Sorry if that was a little melodramatic for a Christmas story. I like to try and capture what I was feeling at the time, and that time of year is never a happy one for me. I'll see if I can get the next part out soon, but no promises. Again, I wish everyone a happy holiday. Stay safe, everyone. Welcome back, folks. I trust we're all doing okay, right? The holidays are far behind us, and it's back to the daily grind, so I decided to boot up my computer and get around to continuing this series. <laughs> Strange to think about how I've been writing these for four months now. Feels like just yesterday I uploaded the first part out of sheer curiosity, and managed to live long enough to keep doing so. I want to thank you guys and gals for sticking around and reading these. You make my day. Sorry for the long intro, let's get on with the story. What started out as a regular day of me eating copious amounts of fish after my squats quickly turned sour as my phone started to ring with an unfamiliar number. Typically, I didn't respond to numbers I didn't have saved, but I was preoccupied with eating, so I checked it without thinking. Almost immediately I regretted my decision as I heard a voice I was wholly unprepared to hear. Hey you there? It's me, Connor. Remember when I asked you to meet up with me later? Well I'm cashing that check now, let's talk. Connor's voice sounded about as aloof and carefree as I did before I ran into him in the old abandoned mansion a couple of parts back. I choked on my fish in surprise and tried to form a coherent response. Spook the fuck out of me, bud, I responded. Where are you planning to meet? 
I'm open all day. And Connor clicked his tongue and huffed softly in thought for a brief moment, then gave me his answer. Nigga. He told me to meet him at an address that didn't ring any bells, along with instructions to dress casually. I wasn't assuming I'd be wearing slacks and loafers to meet with someone I barely know, but his recommendation was appreciated anyways. Six o'clock, all right? We're doing this at six o'clock, he stated, sounding like he was in a hurry and wanted to hang up quickly. I kept affirming him until he hung up the phone suddenly, leaving me out to dry with the sound of silence. I hung up on my end of the line and put my phone down, trying to picture how a meeting with this guy would go down. Ever since the mishap at the old house, I knew in my gut that he couldn't be trusted. He definitely knew more than he let on if his grave reaction to me going inside the old house to do my job was any indication. Through means that remain unexplained to me, he is entrenched in the world of the supernatural in ways I don't comprehend, and I was going to dive headfirst into the lion's den. I hate to admit it, but I was feeling more than a little anxious on my drive to the location he gave me. Given my line of work, I shouldn't be feeling nervous at all. I've killed things that most people only see in nightmares. Why do I care so much just going to a casual meeting? I played some music from a CD to ease my tense nerves and followed the directions my GPS set out for me. About an hour later, I arrived at a single lonely house facing a brown, snow-drenched road. The house looked all but abandoned, with layers of fresh and old snow caking the roof like frosting, a worn white door, and an unshoveled driveway that buried an indistinguishable car. My gut feeling went off like a siren as I mentally planned an escape route in case I needed. Break the front window, run to the car and don't look back, I told myself. I stomped through the snow and hastily knocked on his door, tightly gripping my knife through my pocket. I heard approaching footsteps from inside the house, along with the various clicks and metal wrenching from a large lock being unfastened. The door swung open and nearly smacked me in the nose. Connor stared at me with hazy eyes that were half closed. He gave me a goofy smirk when we met our gaze, brushing his long dry hair out of his face. Hey, hey, you made it, glad to see you, he said lazily. Without waiting for a response, he waved me inside. Come on in, take off your shoes and we can talk over some grub. I reluctantly stepped inside his house and rubbed my boots on his sodden carpet by the door, unlacing them and placing them neatly by the wall. The smell of a cheap, microwavable food permeated through his home eased my tension, and against my better judgment, made me feel welcome and comfortable. Before I could unbutton my coat, I heard a rampant set of feet clacking against the laminated wooden floor and saw a massive Great Dane charging towards me. He headbutted me at full speed, nearly toppling me on my back then whined at me. I stroked the dog's jet black mane as it relentlessly licked my hands. Sven, come here, quit bothering him, Connor called out, and the dog followed his command and charged further into the house. It was at that moment where my perspective on this whole meeting had shifted entirely. I prioritized the danger and mystery of the situation and didn't take a second to consider that Connor could just be an average person like everyone else. I only saw the potentially dangerous supernatural aspect that he held and not the side of him that owned a dog or didn't do his house chores or loved the taste of cheap pizza-flavored snacks. I brushed off the dog hairs on my jacket and folded it under my arm, walking down the hallway. I walked until I ended up in a tiny kitchen space where Connor told me to take a seat on a metal chair at the table as he shuffled various glass plates loaded with smoking pizza bites piled on top to the point of collapsing. Sven snaked around his legs and whined, pointing his nose straight up in the air like an arrow as he begged for a pizza bite. Connor obliged and tossed him one, and he caught it in the air and gingerly chewed the piping hot treat as pepperoni bits dribbled from his maw. Connor brought over two plates of the greasy treats towards the table, placing one in front of me and one for himself. He sat down on the seat opposite of me and started picking at the pile of food. <laughs> so how are you doing, James? How's life treating you? He asked casually through a mouthful of food. Fine, thanks. I've been just fine, I replied, trying not to clue him into my life. I suspected he had his own ideas of what I do, but I'm not going to explain it to him. He nodded nonchalantly and wiped the bits of stringy cheese from his mouth with a napkin and placed it beside his plate. Cool, cool, what have you been up to? Not much, I've been busy with school and whatnot, I said, trying to keep the details vague to get him off my back. 
I've always hated talking about myself in a public environment. It never made me feel at ease. I don't want people I see every day knowing too much about me. I don't have this issue online, though. Hence why I can type this out and not get shy when sending it. So about the last time we met up, he said spontaneously. Why did you go inside the house I told you not to go inside? What were you thinking, man? How did you know what was in there, I replied, and the tension in the room skyrocketed. The only sound present was the sound of Sven whining for more food at Connor's feet. I needed to find out what exactly he knew, and to do that I decided to try and listen carefully to what he says and try and trap him with his own words. He couldn't make eye contact with me as he shoved another piece of food into his mouth. I, uh, well, everyone in that town knows it. That's why no one goes in there. He tried explaining to me, but he definitely knew I was onto him. I didn't need to give a reply. I just gave him a cold stare. Almost immediately he cracked and told me in full, All right, all right, you got me, I just... I know this kind of stuff, all right, I grew up around it. Shit's attracted to me like a magnet, he said quietly, as if our conversation was a private one being held near someone else present in the room that shouldn't be hearing it. You grew up around it. Can you explain that to me? I pressed. His lips curled up in discomfort and he rubbed his hands all over the napkin he had. It's exactly what it sounds like. For a lot of my younger years I saw a lot of ghostly shit. I couldn't step out of the house without seeing a ritual or two going on. So, was your family into playing with Ouija boards or something? He looked over his shoulder cautiously and started rhythmically petting Sven, his fingers giving off a slight twitch. He's nervous, I thought to myself. If he's nervous enough to start displaying those ticks, then I've got him on the ropes. Connor wiped his palms on his shirt and cleared his throat. I was in a cult. He said it so suddenly and methodically that it took me a couple seconds to process what he said. A cult? Like Scientology? I don't doubt that's a rough way to live, but what kind of cult are we... Wasn't just any type of cult, he interrupted me, waving his hands defensively. It's super secretive, like zero results on Google, kind of secretive. Point is, they had their hands in a lot of different bowls, and the shit I saw there kind of insisted upon itself. I was at a loss. How was I supposed to respond? His answer had only given me more questions I wanted to ask. Did you have any family in the cult? How did you get out? What is this cult? I went ahead and asked the third question, preparing for a vague answer. International Triarch Association is what they're called, but everyone shortens it to ITA. I can promise you they're unlike any cult you've ever heard of before, man. I was the equivalent of a cabin boy there, so I don't have any answers on their inner workings, but they have shit there that would blow your mind. He elaborated, slowing regaining confidence in his voice. He was right for one thing. Never heard of ITA in my life. What kind of things do they have in there? You mentioned they dabble with the supernatural, so do they have some kind of artifact? By now, our plates of food had gotten cold, so Connor had pushed his away from his side of the table. Okay, you're not going to believe me when I say this, but they have tech that would blow your mind, he stated, stretching his arms outwards to try and communicate the breadth of this technology. I'm talking like fucking power armor. They have so many lethal poisons that it makes the U.S. government look like a joke. I have no idea how they got their hands on this, but they have it. You try to expose their secrets and... I stopped listening to his voice when some major gears in my head started to click together. Somehow it felt almost familiar to hear about this cult, but in a grim way, like unearthing a traumatic childhood memory. It was on the tip of my tongue, and I had to get to the bottom of it. Connor, I said, sounding stern enough to stop his ranting that I wasn't listening to. Does the ITA have a logo made up of three skulls? I asked, feeling a new sensation of a chill sweeping through the room. I was just about to say that, that's their logo. As soon as those words left his lips, I felt an intense pressure clench my ribs, making it hard to breathe. I know what the ITA is. I encountered them sometime in the past and I've never forgotten it. Close to a year ago, they took part in a raid of my old school during an outbreak of hostile creatures which led to me becoming an assassin in the first place. I knew what these people were capable of. They would have wiped my mind and made me forget the entire incident or done God knows what to me if they caught me after the deal I made with boss. I felt my clothes start to stick to my body with sweat, and I shuffled uncomfortably in my seat. Connor, I know these people, I said out of breath. 
He looked just as horrified as I felt. You do? How the fuck do you know them? At this point I abandoned my plan of not going into detail. My need to understand the ITA far outweighed it. I left my rationality and logic out the door and replaced it with raw emotional inquisitiveness. It was tough to explain everything to him, but I managed to do it, leaving me out of breath and Connor stunned. I became aware of my stomach rumbling from lack of food, so I pulled the plate of food he put in front of me and started munching liberally. Jesus, what a coincidence, eh? said Connor, exhaling heavily. For the record, I'm not going near those guys, I added, which earned me an approving nod from Connor. Well, obviously, he chuckled. In hindsight, coming here was therapeutic. It was uncomfortable to really analyze our shared experiences, but it was also comforting in the same side. I felt like I understood Connor a lot more now, and I can appreciate his laid-back attitude now that I know the more troubling aspects of his life. Kinda lonely being here all by myself. Thanks for coming to visit me, man. Glad to have you back any time, he said gleefully, and I couldn't help myself but let a small smile show. Yeah, no problem. I had gotten up from my chair to leave until Connor got up first and pointed upstairs. Before you go, I gotta show you something cool. I did you a favor for you, he said, rushing down the hallway and up a set of carpeted stairs, motioning me to follow him. I did as I was asked and followed him upstairs, smelling a terrible scent as I did. We entered his cluttered bedroom and I dodged all the strewn laundry and pillowcases, he jogged up to his closet and stood in front of it like he was presenting something revolutionary at TED Talks. So I went ahead and did a neat little favor for you, he announced, sounding proud. Oh, really? That's awfully kind of you, but you didn't have to, I replied. Don't worry, I got your back, he continued. He opened his sliding closet door like he was pushing back a red curtain to show me the crumpled corpse of what looked like a goblin with sickly green skin with a colossal indent between its bulging eyes. Somehow the corpse was entirely bloodless, but instead had trails of dirt were streaked across his face and began to make piles on the floor, smelling like sulfur dunked in pickle juice. I recoiled in disgust and shielded my nose with my hand. Why the fuck do you have that thing in your closet? Why would you even show me? I told him, disgusted. He smiled awkwardly and shook his head. Calm down, man. I just wanted to show you that I can help you go ghostbusting, or whatever you do. He explained. I suppose it's possible that this kill could have been mine in due time, but Connor went ahead and did it as some type of favor. On one hand, I was disgusted that he bothered to show me a corpse in the closet, but I was kind of thankful that he's offering to help me in my killing endeavors. I don't think Boss would want me to take him up on that offer, but I'm glad he made it nonetheless. When I was finished being shocked, I pointed out the giant indent it had in its head. You use a sledgehammer to get this thing? Look at the size of the dent on its head, I said, pointing at the wound. Hammer. Nah, I used. Nah. He trailed off as he reached into his closet and pulled out his weapon. This. What Connor pulled out looked like a brand new monkey wrench that came straight out of a sci-fi film. It had a pristine white handle with purple accents running up to the tip, with an abnormally sharp curve to the area intended for tightening bolts. It looked like someone took a knife to it and tried to sharpen its edges for combat and succeeded. I was curious as to where he got it, but I wasn't able to summon the energy to ask him. Hey, it was nice meeting you and all, but I've got a split, I told him. <laughs> he took the wrench and started playing with it like it was a butterfly knife, flipping it around his fingers with masterful precision. All right, catch you on the flip side then. I've got your number if you want to meet up again, he said, spinning the wrench on his finger like a basketball. I waved Connor goodbye and made my way back downstairs, giving Sven a stroke across the ears as he stood upon the table to eat the leftover food we had left. Soon enough I put on my boots and jacket and headed back home, where I promptly collapsed into bed and fell asleep. The more I think about it, Connor really is stranger than some of the things in the night I end up killing. Nice guy, but a lot to handle. Well that's all I've got for now. I'll go ahead and warn everyone that uploading might be a bit slow in the time coming. Slower than usual, I mean, cause mom and dad are hitting the booze a little too hard and it's starting to affect what little of a household dynamic we have, so I've got to deal with that. I promise to give you guys an especially great story next time I return. As always, stay safe.